Let's talk about the Qatar blockade. The football Gulf Cup is happening in Doha, and at first, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Bahrain said they were boycotting the games. But not anymore. They're sending teams. And that's a big deal because those Gulf nations broke off ties with Qatar in 2017. They imposed a land, sea, and air blockade that's still in effect. But let's rewind a second. Why did these former allies fall out in the first place? Let's start with some basic facts about Gulf countries. And generally, we're talking about six Arab states, Saudi Arabia, Oman, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Bahrain, and Kuwait. They're part of a political and economic alliance called the Gulf Cooperation Council, or the GCC, that was set up in 1981. And they have a lot in common. Much of the enchantment is its timeless, changeless character. Desert landscapes, hot weather, the Arabic language, Islam, similar food and culture, and oil. Gulf countries are also relatively new. Their current borders were only drawn up in the 20th century. The social fabric of these countries is mainly based on tribes. So you can find um, people belonging to the same tribe, uh, let's say, for example, uh, living in Saudi Arabia, in Qatar, in Bahrain, in Emirates, in Kuwait, because they used actually to move freely. And today's ruling families in the Gulf come from these tribes, the Al Thanis in Qatar, the House of Saud in Saudi Arabia, the Al Nahyans in the UAE, the Al Sabahs in Kuwait, the Al Sayyids in Oman, and the Khalifas in Bahrain. Many of these families intermarried, so they sort of have one foot in each other's royal courts. But one thing was clear, Saudi Arabia always saw itself in the lead. It's the largest and most oil-rich Gulf country, and it has Mecca and Medina, Islam's holiest sites. And Saudi Arabia's dominance in the GCC went almost unchallenged until 1995. In Qatar, Sheikh Ahmad bin Khalifa Al Thani announced that he was taking over power from his father. And this emir had his own ideas about the path he wanted for his country. He decided actually to, to have his own uh, relation, uh, international relations uh, with uh, the regional and international players. He decided to have a more balanced approach in his foreign relations. Qatar, for instance, deepened its trading relationship with Iran, Saudi's big rival, because they share a massive natural gas reserve. Qatar also launched a television network called Al Jazeera. And this isn't a plug, it's actually a very key part of the story. You see, while Saudi Arabia had been dropping its support for certain political Islamist groups like the Muslim Brotherhood, Qatar didn't follow suit. And Al Jazeera gave the voices of political Islam and others a platform. The Saudis and the Emiratis, they started to see the Muslim Brotherhood as a major threat to them. Why? Because for Saudi Arabia, as a leader of the Sunni Islam, actually, any other form of Islamist or Islamic organizations are seen as a threat to their leadership of the Muslim world. So Sheikh Hamad was seen as a bit of a rebel. There was even an attempted overthrow of him in 1996, just a year after he came to power, which Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Bahrain all supported. But the coup failed, so as you can imagine, that created even more tension. And then came the Arab Spring. A wave of uprisings in Tunisia, Egypt, Syria, Yemen, and Bahrain saw people take to the streets to overthrow authoritarian leaders. And Qatar's Al Jazeera media network covered it all. People are bowing The deadly nationwide crackdown has attracted international condemnation. The anti-government momentum is building up. The Saudis actually they did not like that a lot because they were really concerned that uh, that wave of Arab Spring might just come to, the, to their shores. Especially after the, the collapse of Hosni Mubarak regime in Egypt. What happened in Egypt after the Arab Spring really made Saudi's leaders nervous. And this is just one place and one example of how the split with Qatar widened even further. Egypt held its first democratic election in 2012, won by Mohamed Morsi, who was backed by the Muslim Brotherhood. A year later, after pro- and anti-Morsi protests, the military forced him out. What followed was a violent clampdown that killed hundreds of his supporters, and Al Jazeera covered that too. 
Everyone in the square, including journalists covering the protest, came under a hail of apparently indiscriminate gunfire. This was a team from Al Jazeera. Qatar, meanwhile, welcomed Muslim Brotherhood members who fled, people that Egypt's military leaders called terrorists. So leaders in the GCC started to think Qatar had gone rogue. Those countries broke off diplomatic ties in 2014, and they wanted the U.S. to back them up. The Saudis were really best off by the Obama uh, administration foreign policy towards the region. Obama was mainly occupied with uh, negotiation with Iran over its nuclear uh, program, and he was less sensitive towards the concerns of the, of the Saudis. But when Donald Trump entered the White House, things changed. When Trump actually came to power in 2017, the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, and the Egyptians, who already had problems with Qatar because of the Arab Spring and because of Qatar foreign relations, uh, they decided actually to take it to the very end with Qatar this time. In other words, the GCC's main players said, it's time to do something about Qatar. So on June 5, 2017, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain, and Egypt imposed a blockade. Note that Oman and Kuwait didn't take part. Air, sea, and land routes were suddenly closed off. Trade in goods like dairy were banned, and Saudi Arabia even expelled Qatari camels. But more importantly, Qatari citizens were kicked out of those blockading countries, and thousands of families were broken up. We found ourselves lost. We may like, you know, be separated from our children and return back to Bahrain. A lot of families are integrated between different countries in the Gulf region. Why should we be separated because of politics? The blockading countries also presented a list of demands. Some of the big ones were that Qatar downgrade diplomatic ties with Iran, shut down Al Jazeera altogether, and cut ties to so-called terrorist groups. We have uh, taken this step um, with great uh, pain in order to uh, make sure that uh, Qatar understands that these policies are not acceptable and not sustainable and that they must change. But Qatar maintained that it didn't support terrorism and refused to budge on their demands. We believe that mainly the main issue is not, is not about terrorism. The main issue is opposing differences and the way to shut the other voice. And uh, maybe uh, they are looking at Qatar that it's punching over its weight. The blockade did initially impact Qatar's economy, but it did bounce back after Qatar took steps like shoring up its banks, trading more with Iran and Turkey, and manufacturing its own products to avoid relying on imports. So with Qatar doing its thing, and the blockading countries refusing to lift the embargo, there have been few signs of a breakthrough. But some suspect that with the Gulf Cup going ahead as normal, these former allies might slowly be opening up to the idea of playing nice. Thanks for watching and sending us your ideas for future Start Here episodes. Our team is already working on them. But do keep sharing your thoughts, questions, and comments on Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. We love hearing from you.